Okay, uh, so since it's already 8036, so why get yourself, why not get yourself city so we can get started? So um, on Monday's lecture, we talk about, and we give you guys a, a very brief introduction about um, what uh, mass transfer and separation uh, is about. And we give some like uh, basic concepts. So today we're gonna continue uh, to explain these concepts. And uh, I will give you some examples about some typical uh, separation process. Uh, and this, uh, this separation process is not only being used in the chemical engineering uh, field per se. Uh, they, find, they actually find uh, applications in many different industries. Because in the end, um, when we consume chemicals, whether it's water or you know pharmaceutical or anything, purity kind of like uh, really matters, right? The, the quality of your chemical really de depends on the purity. So um, great. So then in on Monday, we talk about, uh, we already talked about briefly three different type of separations. I mean, based on different mechanisms, we talk about uh, a phase separation based on, phase separation based, based on <clears throat> uh, phase creation, um, which includes either uh, distillation or precipitation, in which you uh, <clears throat> kind of like create a new phase from the, the, the phase, so you can separate the two phases. And, uh, and then we talk about this phase addition method in which you add a uh, uh, absorbent, right? And this, this absorbent will selectively um, absorb Kind of like a um, so your feed is a is a mixture that uh, has several different components, and uh, this absorbent will selectively um, kind of absorb one or several component of your feed so that you can separate them out. And this absorbent typically is a different phase from your uh, feed, right? For example, if you use a solid, uh, if your feed is liquid, then you can add a solid absorbent. And that's absorption and stripping process. Um, uh, and stripping is basically the reverse process of uh, absorption in, in which you regenerate your absorbent. Uh, then if, let's say, if your fade is a liquid and you add another liquid that's immiscible with your fade, then that's liquid-liquid extraction. Okay. And we talk about the third one is um, adsorption. Uh, again, in, in this case, you, you use a solid agent uh, we call it adsorbent, right? To um, selectively uh, absorb some component from your from your from from your feed uh, feed mixture. But in this case, the difference between uh, adsorption and absorption is, uh, let's say, if you have a I mean, in the case for absorption, um, you have a you you know you use a solid absorbent, which is like kind of the particle. And then this solid particle will be able to absorb right? if you have your feed coming in here, right? That contains probably, let's say, two compounds, A plus B. For the case of absorbent, then one of them uh, will go into the bulk of your particle, right? Whereas in the case of adsorption, you again, you use a solid agent. We, we call it uh, sorbent, right? Or more specifically, adsorbent. In this case, it's only, um, let's do another, uh, let's say C plus D. Then it's only gonna be, um, one of the phases will be, one of the component will be uh, absorbed to the surface, right? So to the surface of your particle, okay? Uh, and uh, this is being used for water filtration uh, especially home use, right? If you, uh, I mean, if you have a filter, um, so that's where in, in the future, typically you have the activated carbon, which is a type of carbon material have that have very high surface area, and uh, it can absorb all the it can absorb the organic compounds in the water and just make it taste better. So then. Um, the fourth type of uh, separation process is a uh, is in the process in, in which you can apply 
So you, you introduce a barrier. <laughs> right. Barrier is something that you know can uh, allow um, one of the component in your fit mixture to selectively pass through. Okay, and typically it's a membrane that has um, like different permeability to each component in your mixture, so it only allows uh, one component to go through. Okay. Um, so we will talk about some examples later. Then we have uh, <clears throat> the fifth type is you apply a force or gradient or field, right? Or gradient to your feed, right? This uh, this field can be, let's say, um, gravity. Then you are applying basically, uh, not gravity, like um, acceleration field, right? So you are applying, um, uh, for example, in, in centrifuge. So you're creating a um, kind of like an acceleration force in which uh, the component with different density will separate, right? Because the component with different density, they will uh, experience different force in the same uh, force field, right? Or it can be you apply a electric field, right? That's in the case or in, in actual four races. So then for charged species, and uh, the, the electric field will exert a force on your charged species. They're gonna move under this charge, uh, on, on this electric force, okay? However, different component may have different, uh, kind of like, let's say, uh, velocity of friction when they kind of like swim in your medium. So that's how you can separate them. We'll, we'll talk about this later. And electrophoresis is being used in, especially in uh, biotechnologies, used to separate biomolecules. You know, we have in, in biomolecules include protein, um, DNA, RNA, or other big molecules. These molecules typically, they have, they, they carry charge and they're, they're bulky, they're big. So if you put them into a gel and apply a electric field, then these uh, <clears throat> biomolecules, they will move, they will swim in the gel, but due to their size difference, they will swim in different speed are you in different velocity? Then that's how you can separate them. Okay. So uh, okay. Now let's go into some examples. So here are some examples for uh, uh, separation operations based on phase creation. Um, so uh, this is a table from your textbook. Uh, there are more examples than we can talk about in the class. So I, I just choose a few of them to talk about. Um, so. The first one is condensation or partial condensation or vaporization in which you have, let's say if you have a, a vapor or liquid or mixture, right? And uh, and you if you use a heat exchanger to, uh, if you take heat out, if you remove heat and it's a condensation process, then in your mixture, um, the one with uh, higher, with, with um, higher, uh, so, I mean, they will have like the mixture, the different component will have different like boiling temperature, right? So then the one with the, um, with a higher temperature, boiling temperature will be condensed first. Then you can create a liquid phase, right? And that's how you can separate your liquid, liquid phase from your vapor phase. And this is, be, this is being used, for example, in the uh, recovery of hydrogen and the nitrogen from ammonia, right? We know in industry ammonia synthesis, uh, you have hydrogen reacting with, um, with nitrogen <clears throat> to form, um, you know, ammonium. Okay, this process is called a Hubble-Bosch process and it only happens at very high temperature and pressure, but the conversion rate is, uh, is not ideal. It's not 100%. So you're in your affluent, there's gonna be a mixture of hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonium. So then you need to kind of separate your <clears throat> hydrogen and nitrogen, and you can you can <clears throat> you can just like the the, the case uh, the high <clears throat> the isolate hydro hydrogen example we talked about in our in our last lecture. So you can separate them. You can then you can fit some of the unreacted reactants back to your reactor. So in this case because hydrogen and nitrogen gas, they have very different boiling temperature. So if you um, apply uh, a pressure, then you can condense nitrogen from separate uh, into liquid, then you can separate nitrogen from hydrogen, okay? 
so this, is, like I said, this is by partial condensation and high pressure. Another example is uh, flash vaporization, right? This is like mostly used in the reco recovery of water from uh, from seawater, right? So, uh, you know, you, uh, a, a lot of territories and countries on this planet is does not have fresh water. I'm uh, one noble example is like people. I mean, the countries in the Middle East, right? So although they are surrounded by the uh, by the ocean, they do not have fresh they do not have access to fresh water. So in this country, one of the one of the jobs um, for the industry is to produce fresh water from seawater, right? So they have plenty of seawater. Then now the goal is to how to separate salt from fresh water. There are many different ways to do that. And one way is to do this so-called um, flash vaporization. So, um, uh, so then you 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 pump like seawater into a, a like a reactor, and if you reduce the pressure, then water will evaporate, right? So you produce water vapor from seawater. Then the water vapor can be uh, you know can be sent to a con um, condenser, and you will be able to get uh, fresh water. And distillation, right? This is like the, uh, I mean, the 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 separation process we used most often in chemical uh, chemical industry. So uh, we'll talk about this much more in detail later in our class. Then we have ev evaporation, and this is again similar to flash vaporization. Uh, this can be used to extract water from seawater. Uh, but now the difference, instead of like applying, kind of reducing the pressure of your reactor. So water evaporates. In this case, you just apply, you just um, add heat to your mixture, just boil water, then you can produce water vapor. Then you have crystallization. Um, this is uh, kind of like a generating of um, uh, solids from, from a solution. Okay, so then uh, for Separation operations based on phase addition, some examples. Uh, one example I wanna talk about is um, separation of carbon dioxide from uh, combust combustion products by the by absorption, right? We know uh, in, in the United States or even globally, um, electricity is mostly, mostly produced by in power plants in which we burn fossil fuel, right? So in the past, it's mostly coal, but nowadays the 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 the, the primary fuel has changed has changed gradually from uh, coal to petroleum and uh, natural gas. So um, you know, from your basic chem chemistry knowledge, we know all fossil fuels are made of hydrocarbons that contains, uh, you know, carbon and hydrogen. When you burn burn them in air. In air, you are going to produce CO two plus water, and water vapor in this case. And we know for sure CO two is, um, since, since um the industrial revol revolution like three, and four centuries ago, humans have been using fossil fuel, and we've been producing CO two and emit them into the air. So, um, as a result, because we know CO two is uh, when you emit them into the air, CO2 can, uh, is a very good absorbent of infrared, right? And we, we know in, for our Earth, we, we, uh, we take sunlight, right? But during the, during the day and during the uh, night, the surface of our planet, of Earth, will emit the part of the energy back to the space by infrared, okay? That's how Earth maintains a kind of like a uh, stable temperature for all the creatures uh, to, to, to live and prosper. But CO2 is a very good uh, infrared absorb, um, absorbent. As a result, as the concentration of CO2 in the air goes up, it's gonna absorb more uh, infrared energy. That just leads to the temperature of our atmosphere and our ocean gradually goes up. So, um, and if you have interest in, in this, my, in my, uh, you might, <clears throat> Uh, in my not another course about electrochemical uh, system, I, in the first lecture I talk about uh, how this has changed the, um, the 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 climate and how we what we can do to combat this problem.
Okay, but let's back to this 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 topic. So when we burn fossil fuel, we're going to produce CO two and water and uh, water vapor. And now we know uh, CO two is not good to the environment. So um, so so then the industry when the industry realizes. They started to uh, say, "Well, maybe we should do something. We can we can just separate CO two from the uh, for, from the emission, then we use the CO two as some kind of chemical feedstock, or maybe you can store CO two in the ground, right? So that's down in a uh, absorption column. So, uh, sorry, let's see, let's look at this example here." <clears throat> So um, let's look at this example, right? So here are, there are three pictures. Let's look at the one on the bottom left. So here, this is like a kind of like a, a very simplified, very, like a example about how we do this. So you have, uh, this is like a combustion chamber. You just burn fossil fuel, then you're gonna produce a uh, kind of like a um, emission. Now, if you can send this emission into this, this is like a, a absorption tower where in the top, from the top you um you feed typically you feed your absorbent right and most likely in industry right now the standard practice is use an aqueous solution of uh, uh, a uh, ethanol amine right this is like a base because we know CO2 is an acidic uh, as gas so then this amine will basically um, scrub the uh, the emission and uh, kind of like dissolve the CO2 into it. Then you can send this, then you can emit the CO2 free gas out while send the uh, absorbent, liquid absorbent into a um, kind of like a, this is like a stri stripper, right? In which if you apply thermal energy, you heat the mixture up, right? Then CO2 solubility in this mixture will reduce, then you're gonna produce CO2 gas, right? You're gonna separate your CO2 uh, from your um, liquid absorbent, then you regenerate the CO2, right? Now this CO2 becomes a chemical product, right? And uh, in some cases, people try to uh, kind of inject it into underground, right? Because CO2, in the, the carbon in CO2 essentially originally comes from fossil fuel, fuel that's being bur buried on the ground. So uh, if we want to get rid of this carbon, then we, we can send, send them back to uh, you know, on the ground. So this is what, what uh, like a, a schematic shows how this process is done. So you have industrial process, any industrial process, not only the uh, not only the uh, power plant, just any plant that use fossil fuel to generate heat will emit CO two. Then if you have a CO two uh, capture process like this, like what is shown here on the left. Uh, like the, the 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 bottom left, then you can compress the CO two, and in the there there are several ways to deal with the capture of CO two. Like I said, one way is to uh, the so called storage, right? You just pump them into the underground reservoir. Right? In this case, you pump them into the underground reservoir, and uh, uh, so this underground reservoir could be some cavern. Um, that is exposed because we drill natural gas from the under, underground reservoir, right? Now you, you just kind of pump some gas back into the, ca the, the cave. Another way to deal with the uh, separated CO2 is to use it as a chemical feedstock, uh, where when you have the CO2, it's a carbon source. And if we can not get rid of the fossil fuel in the short term, if we, we, ha we still have to rely on them for like, uh, for the, uh, you know, upcoming several decades, then instead of drilling, why we why we don't use CO2 as a as a you know carbon source to produce the fuel and other chemicals we you know we we, we are relying on, right? That's kind of the thought of some people. So now here what we do is you 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 use the captured CO2 as a feedstock, you send them into a CO2 converter, right? This is kind of a chemical reactor, use CO2 water as the reactants. <laughs> 
and, and then you use re renewable electricity from solar, wind, or nuclear <clears throat> that is emission free, then you um, you can produce, ideally you can produce fuels, chemicals, and then the fuels can be uh, can become the energy we use to uh, to power our transportation and uh, to power to for the power power plant, and the chemicals can uh, can be used to you know just to produce anything we we have been relying on. Then we form kind of this kind of a circle. We close when we close the carbon circle, then we do not uh, kind of produce any new CO two emission into the air. Right. This is kind of like a a, a vision uh, some people hold. Right. And there's some very active research uh, on this topic right now, and uh, uh, the Department of Energy is also has also uh, also have uh, many projects to support this. Okay, but if you think it deeply, right, you guys have already taken thermodynamics, so you know how to do a uh, thermodynamic uh, closed loop analysis, right? In this whole process, you drill uh, oil, gas, or other carbon or fossil fuel from the underground. You burn them and produce CO2. Now you capture them, you capture the CO2, and you do some chemical reactions, turn them back into the chemical fuel, right? Now you think about this whole, like, thermodynamic, uh, if, you, if you think about this whole process, and we know some, we know from thermodynamics, uh, you know, thermodynamic, the, the um, first law is energy is conserved, right? But second law says entropy uh, is entropy always increase, which means this process cannot be 100% efficient, which means in the whole process, even though you go back, you go back to the you know, initial point, right? You start from one uh, methane molecule, you burn it to produce CO2, you capture CO2, then you react with water and uh, you, you, form, you, you react the form CO2 with water and you, you produce methane, you're back to the point, you're back to the initial point. But if you think about the whole process, you are actually inputting a lot of energy into this process, even though the, the chemical loop is go back to the you know, initial point, right? So from that point, whether this closed loop makes sense, some people, some scientists kind of are criticizing that, right? If we want to get rid of fossil fuel, why we not, why do this? Why bother, right? If you have a renewable electricity, why just not use renewable electricity, right? Why bother using electricity, your renewable electricity to convert CO2 back to fossil fuel, which overall the thermodynamics circle is not efficient. Okay. So some scientists believe this is like uh, the 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 uh, the the kind of the the um, the, the, the oil industry the, this, this is kind of one of their excuse of the oil industry to slow down their transition. Right. But anyway, just I just want to give you from the scientific or tech, technological point of view, we should understand, you know, if, even if they pr propose something, does it make sense from a scientific or technological technological point of view? Okay. Now, um, this, the, the, uh, the first type of separation process we talk about is using a barrier. And this barrier is mostly uh, a membrane, right? A membrane is typically, uh, uh, there are two types of membranes. There could be uh, a non-porous membrane, which is and the membrane is usually a either a polymer or a uh, ceramic. For a non-porous membrane, it does not have pores, okay. And uh, so, um, but for a polymer, it could have some solubility for some small organic molecules or even water. So um, when we use them, then the organic molecules and the, and the, let's see if this is membrane. Let's draw a if this is membrane. Uh, we have if we have a mixture on the left where you have some organic molecules and water, then they will have some solubility into this membrane because it's made of polymer. And uh, then if there's a concentration gradient on both sides, then you can expect uh, you know these these particles or these like molecules they will diffuse from the left to right right under either a concentration gradient or other driving force. Whereas uh, a second type of membrane is a porous membrane uh, in which you have some, you know, very like pores with different pore size. And this is a, some, this is, the pore size can be tuned by tuning the materials or the, the, the membrane prop, per, uh, fabrication process. So in this case, 
again, if you have a mixture, right? And if you have like, you know, mixture with two compounds with different size, then apparently the, uh, you know, the compound with a size that's smaller in the pore size will have a much higher permeability uh, through the membrane because they can easily, you know, tunnel through the membrane, uh, you know, goes through the membrane by tunneling through the, the pores, okay? These are two type of, uh, uh, two type of like a <clears throat> membrane. So, so then um, there, are, there are many different type of membrane based process. Here are like four examples. The first one is osmosis. Uh, let's see, so osmosis is a process where, uh, let's say, and this is like a very simplified example, right? If you have this, if you have a device with this kind of U shape, you put a membrane here, and if you put two like a two solutions with different concentration on the left and right hand side, right? Mm -hmm. Now because the two solutions they have different concentration, so then that creates a chemical driving force between this this membrane, right? Because the uh, for example, in the, in this case, we're talking about so, uh, salty water and salty water and fresh water. And uh, because water has, I mean, on the left side, you have higher concentration of salt, which means you have a lower concentration of water, right? On the right, right hand side, you have a higher concentration of water, right? Then water, I mean, this membrane is, is this is a membrane is typically, uh, you know, permeable to, uh, oh, sorry, this is a reverse osmosis, but, but let's talk about osmosis first, right? So this membrane is, is permeable to water, then if without pressure, if without pressure, then water has the kind of tendency of going through this membrane from right to left, right? Because like I said, it has a high, water has a higher concentration right on the right-hand side than the left-hand side, okay? And then over time, it's gonna create a, and this process is called osmosis. And over time, this process will stop only when you generate a, uh, you know, height difference between the two solutions, right? And we know this height difference corresponds to a pressure difference, right, from, from physics. And uh, this pressure is called osmo osmosis pressure. This is basically the pressure you need to, uh, I mean, when you have, like, a, like I said, when you have a two solutions, on both sides of a membrane that with different concentration, there's always a kind of like a driving force that's gonna that's that's gonna uh, drive the high concentration species uh, to go to the the other side with low concentration, right? As if there's a pressure, you know, press press this uh, molecule to go through the membrane, right? This is the osmos uh, osmosis pressure, and and it's obviously it's gonna be uh, dependent on the concentration difference. And re reverse osmosis is basically, as the name suggests, is a reverse process of osmosis in which you apply externally, you apply a pressure, right? In this case, let's look at this, this example. Uh, let's see, how do we... How do we? Okay. Yeah. So, um, in this case, right? Because we we just talk about if without any external pressure, water is gonna flow in this way. But now, if we apply a pressure, right? And if the pressure is large enough. It's if it's larger than the osmos osmosis pressure, it's gonna push the, the, the water in the salty water through the membrane, okay? Basically, you know, go against the, 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 the concentration gradient because now you are inputting an uh, external energy, in this case, a mechanical pressure to drive this process. And this process, and this is actually, right, this process is also being used in the, Desalination of seawater, and actually, it's it's a very uh, it, it is a very like a I mean, most commonly used method to produce uh, fresh water from salty water. Okay, then um, the third separation process is dialysis, right? In which you have a porous membrane here, right? This is different from you know re re reverse osmosis, in which you have a non-porous membrane 
So water only goes through the membrane because water can dissolve into this polymer, right? Whereas in the dialysis, you have a porous membrane that have small pores. And uh, if you fade a mixture into your reactor and you apply pressure, then you should be able to all other type of driving force. You can be, you can just separate uh, your, uh, you can, you can do the separation. Um, then dialysis is uh, mostly, I mean, one notable example is, is um, blood dialysis, right? Because we know uh, our human body, our kidney is in charge of get rid of any, uh, you know, toxic chemicals our body produce during our, you know, uh, met metabolism, right? One of such is urea. Um, but if somehow your kidney, you have a kidney disease, so your kidney doesn't work properly, right? One way is to get a kidney transplant, right? But that's typically very expensive and it takes time. And uh, before you can have a kidney transplant, right? Then the only way you can survive, you can do, you do not, you know, poison yourself by your by your own metabolize metabolite is to go to the hospital so they can do a blood dialysis for dialysis for you right so in the blood dialysis we have a membrane i mean in this schematic you should this is this membrane here right on the left hand side is your blood where you have the uh you have like your uh blood cell right this is you have some like uh, like <clears throat> uh cells right like red blood cells white blood cells you also have some uh, you know, big molecules, organic, like a uh, mm, dissolve into your blood, like protein and some other stuff. Then you also have some small molecules, like a soup, uh, like a mm, glu glu glucose, urea, and other stuff, and uh, even ions, right? And uh, in the uh, dialysis process, so um, I mean, the the the, the thing in the sheet is a, is an instrument to do this. You draw blood from a patient, and you pump the blood into this device that's called dialyzer right mm -hmm. in the dialyzer basically the operation here is that you you have two streams flowing by the membrane you have the human blood you know flowing up Let's see hmm. so you have a human blood flowing about uh, you know uh flowing like from bottom to top then you have a so-called di uh, dialysate flowing from, you know, top to bottom. In this case, now, as we, we as we talk about, because the concentration, uh, I mean, the 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 the, the more, all the species will have different concentration on both sides of the membrane, right? That creates a uh, driving force, like chemical driving force, and so that the, the small molecules, some of the toxic molecules, for example, urea can just move uh, across this membrane, right? For example, from the left to hand side to the right hand side, right? Then you can pump this blood back into this human's body, this patient's body. Then this way you you basically de uh, detoxic the blood and uh, and uh, then treat this patient. Right? This is how the dialysis process works. Okay. So um, then, then uh, the uh, and the fourth type of like the uh, separation process is 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 uh, <clears throat> adsorption, and, uh, and in this case, let's see, um, are we talk about this adsorption is a process in which you have the um, you know the chemical of your uh, of your component in your uh, in your feed being abs absorbed to the surface of a absorbent. Okay, um, then. Uh, so one one example of this is um, water softening, right? Similar, I mean, similar to 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 to, to uh, it's it's different from like a uh, you know desalination of your water. In this case, in, in in desalination, you remove all the ions from a salty water, so you can produce fresh water. So water softening is a different process in which we know water contains can contain a lot of minerals, right? Typically, the minerals refers to ions like, you know, divalent cations like magnesium cation, calcium cation, right? And uh, they are called minerals for a reason because this water, we know from chemistry that the, the, the solubility of 
magnesium salt and calcium salt is typically lower than the uh, solubility of sodium salt, right? As a result, if your water is contains a lot of uh, magnesium or calcium cation, or the water is hot, then there's a very high tendency that you can produce, um, you know, magnesium hydroxide and the calcium hydroxide precipitate, right? And this is um, not good for piping because over time this can, this you know, solid precipitate can jam your uh, tube, right? Cause problem. Uh, so then. In the, uh, in the in the process of like water uh, softening, basically, uh, you have uh, let's say you know here let's see, you have let's say this is your uh, water that contains your magnesium calcium cation. You pump your water into this absorption column that contains your absorbance. In this case, your absorbance is gonna be uh, your absorbance gonna be an ion exchange resin, right? Your ion exchange resin, chemically, it's a kind of like a polymer bead that has uh, alines, right? In this case, sulfuric so, so uh, anion. Then, and uh, this anion is attached to sodium cation, right? This is a solid uh, resin. Then, because of the, um, you know, because the, the chemical driving force, when you have water flowing into this, that contains magnesium cation and calcium cation, then uh, calcium is gonna replace sodium. Right? In this case, calcium is gonna replace your sodium and being attached to your resin. And then, then uh, sodium ion will come off of your resin and enter your water, right? In this process, can, you basically replace um, the magnesium or calcium cation in your water with sodium ion, which has a much higher solubility and, uh, and and so that's how you can soft how you soft soften your water. Okay. Oh, sorry. This is like ion exchange. Yeah, this is ion exchange process. This is not as adsorption. Okay. So for um, for the adsorption and uh, I mean adsorption is like I said the 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 process where you have a porous carbon. Uh, if this is a porous carbon, then you can uh, kind of absorb the ions to the surface of your porous carbon, right? <clears throat> and some organic compound to the to the to the porous carbon, right? If this is carbon. So and the, the um one feature of the adsorption or the ion exchange process is that all this um adsorbent and uh, the, the 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 resin you use for ion exchange uh, they have a limited capacity, right? Because for for example, for the carbon, you use its surface for the adsorption process. When its surface is kind of fully covered by the kind of like the um, by the ions or organic compounds you wanted to uh, extract, then your uh, your 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 absorbent is saturated. Right? In the case of ion exchange resin, you only have a limited amount of sodium ions. That are available for ion exchange when they are all being used up, then uh, your um, your your resin is kind of saturated. So then, for this reason, um, the the adsorption ion exchange process, you need kind of you you kind of need to regenerate your absorbent over time, right? So and that's how you know in this here we have a kind of like a regenerating process. And the regeneration process is kind of like like the reverse process. Um, for example, if you want to regenerate the resin, right? Instead of flowing a water that contains um, calcium and magnesium ion, you just flow a water that contains sodium ion, right? Then that sodium ion will replace your calcium and magnesium that's being being uh, attached by the resin. Then you can regenerate your uh, resin. Okay. So for this reason, this. This separation process can only be done batch-wise or semi-continuously. You cannot you cannot do it continuously because, like I said, you, your your uh, your adsorbent can become saturated, so you have to regenerate them from time to time. <clears throat> so um, then, 
Then uh, the last separation operation we uh, talk about is, um, you know, you can apply a field or gradient to create a like driving force to separate your different components. Uh, a most common one is centrifuge, right? And uh, I mean, every every lab, most lab typically, if you do do some chemical synthesis, will have a centrifuge in which you can separate your react, reaction medium with your with your products. So that's very simple, which I'm not going to talk about. So uh, um, another example is electrolysis, right? Electrolysis is uh, is also being used to treat water, right? And it's also being used for concentrating of heavy water. Um, and then how does it work? In an uh, electrolysis process, the, the device contains uh, you know, two electrodes. You have one electrode here, you have another electrode here. Then you have many ion exchange membranes. And typically you have you know, cation exchange membrane, anion exchange membrane, cation exchange membrane, anion exchange membrane. Right? You stack them alternatively, right? So uh, then, when you then when you pump uh, a salty water through, right, from bottom to you know bottom to 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 top, now you apply an electric field, right? In this case, let's say the electric field is being applied in. Uh, okay, this is okay. It's being applied. In, I think it's in this direction, right? This is your E field direction. Then. Um, Cations, well, let's see. Oh, so this is an anion, this is anion exchange membrane. It, so uh, the, the ion exchange mem membrane basically works by kind of like a columbic re repulsion, right? So if, uh, if you have a polymer membrane, non-porous membrane that carries positive charge, then this membrane only allows negative charge to go through, right? Does it make sense? Because it carries positive charge, so it's going to repel positive, positive, uh, positive uh, cation from the solution, right? So if this membrane carries positive, uh, positive charge, it's going to repel the um, you know the sodium ion, right? So when you have electric field in this direction, overall we know cation is going to move uh, you know in this direction, right? But anion is going to move uh, in the reverse direction. Right, so when you have a, a feed, right, the red is a feed going into these three chambers, then um, you know, kind of like a C. Sodium ion, like cation, cannot go through this membrane. Right, that's that's a no. Only anion can move through. Okay, and for this, uh, this is like a. It carries negative charge, so it's a cation exchange membrane. So, but sodium ion can move across this uh, cation exchange membrane, right? Here, it's opposite, right? You have, you know, anion moving in this direction. Yeah, go ahead. Why would it move across and not just stick? Um, it does not stick because you have an electric field driving it, right? So. It, the, this electric field will exert a force onto your ions. And although the membrane will pose some frictional force to impede its motion, okay. but if it's if it's dri if this driving force is big enough, then it's gonna overcome the frictional force, right? So then this frictional force will give the will generate resistance for this inactual you know chemical reactor, right? Whereas the electric field will generate the driving force. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So um, again, we let's look at this. I mean, we have to look at what happens at each membrane in order to under, in order to understand this process. So in look, let's look at here. So we have a feed that contains salt, right? Cations and anions flowing into the kind of the chamber between these two membranes. But as, as we said, the mem membrane on the left only allows anions to cross, whereas the membrane on the right only allows cation to cross. As a result, all the ions will move into this chamber, whereas in the chamber next to this, ions move outward, right? As you can see here, right? 
ions move outward, right? So which means you're gonna deplete ions. Then as a result, when you when your salty water move goes through this whole process, the in this stream, you're gonna have high the concentration of your salt is gonna be higher. In this stream, the concentration of your salt is gonna be lower. That's how you can basically desalinate uh, salty water and produce potable water. Okay. So last example, uh, this is electrophoresis. Uh, we talked about electrophoresis is again being used in uh, you know bio applications uh, used to separate uh, macro molecules like protein, DNA, RNA. These macro molecules they carry charge, right? They are bulky. So when you apply electric field, so uh, when you apply electric field, they are gonna experience an electrostatic force. I mean, th this electrostatic force will make them move in the medium. Whereas meanwhile, because they are bulky, so they will experience a hydrodynamic frictional force uh, from the environment. So you're gonna have a uh, retarding force, right? It's called retarding force. Uh, but at some point you're gonna reach a steady state, right? And the velocity will be basically dependent on the size of your particle, the charge of your particle, as well as the uh, viscosity of your, you know, of your medium. So uh, in, so when you, I mean, this is like a schematic showing how electrophoresis work, right? When you have a mixture of solution contains different macromolecules at the top, and when you apply an extra field, like I said, different molecules will move in a different speed. So, um, you know, small molecule, you know, small molecule will move faster because they are smaller, right? And uh, a mo higher molecular weight molecule, they will move uh, slower because they are bulky. Uh, over time, and uh, you know, for the same amount of time, then you will be able to say, you know, these different molecules they separate in this in this medium. Right? This is how uh, you know in the biotechnology field they use this technique to basically uh, you know examine what type of you know um, macromolecules they produced in the process. Okay. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, so we will continue on uh, Wednesday.